I think over generations we've been socialized precisely not to believe in ourselves. We were told everything that we wear was not good enough. That was the whole essence of colonization. But we don't seem to believe everything we are told. So why did we particularly no, believe? No, but you see, I think. <laughs> why did we particularly believe this one? <laughs> you know, I, I think. Why did we choose to believe this? Is, <laughs> this is where, where the difference between what we say and what we do comes in. Even when we say we don't believe, do we act as if we don't believe? Do we act as if we don't really believe we are inferior? I actually think the more damage for me is that we are not having conversations like this because I think it's, it's okay to accept. Let me use a, a different example. You know, when you look at violence in South Africa, it is unrealistic to expect that that society could have transformed without going through violence. In other words, the violence that is going on now. Because the, over the years, they internalized the perpetration of violence as the norm. What is damaging is that there is no conversation by intellectuals to identify where this thing comes from, what the causes are, and then to come up with solutions of how to combat it. And I think at an Africa level we're doing the same. We're not systematically identifying why we are where we are, which is inevitable because of where we came from. But if we don't have the conversation and identify it and accept it and then say, what are we going to do to change it? We're never going to change it. You see, it's a, it's a very tricky thing. I even don't think we are very ignorant about that. You don't think so? No, no. no. <laughs> you see, even it, 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 with the absence of uh, a conversation like that, you see, you can learn from a conversation, or you can learn from what happens to you. Or what has happened to you? Because if we go out there and can study other situations and understand them, what is it that stops us understanding our own situation? It's something I can't understand. Oh, and things that we experience every day, mm -hmm. you, you, you see? So something that has happened, for example, I keep asking myself, and. We have a conversation here with our people. It's like, how can the history of Rwanda and what we have gone through not teach us a lesson? Mm -hmm. how? how? How can we have a genocide here? So many people die, others get involved in the killing. And this is all wasted. Nobody learns from it. How? how, how? That's not human. So so what, something so what must. Is, so what is it? <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, at least, uh, at least uh, I, I will say from a small experience. <coughs> Here we have this conversation. We have had this conversation for the last 20 years. And, and I think <laughs> some of the progress that has taken place here is because of that. The conversation is happening. Oh, yes. But and, and then learning from what has reality. happened. Not what has happened in other situations. Mm. That one we learn from as well, but we start with our own. Mm. We can't run away from it. The tragedy of Rwanda is our own. Mm. We've been part of it, if you will. Mm. So we can't go looking for solutions elsewhere before we start looking for them here. My, my takeaway, Mr. President, yes. is that I can take solace from the fact that you say part of the solution came from the conversation, yes. which is what I'm suggesting, that Africa needs to have a conversation, we need to. an honest yes. inside conversation amongst ourselves. Because when we are with outsiders, we cannot have that conversation, rightly so. But the trouble is that we are not creating the space and time to have an internal and honest conversation. Absolutely, I agree with you, and uh, I think you, you, you said it earlier, and um, you see, even thinking that somebody will come and oppress your problem yeah. is part of it, because on one hand, as we sit and talk about these problems, then when we go out and go to our countries and our places, or either of work or wherever we live, 
we, we leave that corrective responsibility, we, we, leave, we, we forget about it. Somebody else we, must uh -huh. do it. Mm -hmm. We go back to our small mm -hmm. places and communities and, you know, that's where the competition happens, happens and ends. <laughs> you see? Yeah. So we, we, uh, the more we talk about this, the more we get together, the more we... And, and the more we are able to accept responsibility for these failures and not keep saying it is somebody else who caused it. Mm. Mm. We've seen it. Yeah. We've seen, uh, we, we have had these discussions. Uh, even uh, poverty or conflicts or everything, it's like people caught up in it, supposed to manage that. Sometimes they keep pointing fingers elsewhere. It's the other one who doesn't wish me well. It's the other one who, you know, comes by the night and causes problems here and by the day he has crossed the border and is on the other side. And mm -hmm. the whole thing gets lost in that. Mm -hmm. There is not saying, okay, even if this one is part of my problem. What can I do? What can I do and why don't I first deal with my part of the problem that I am actually, that I am actually responsible for, mm -hmm. not anybody else. So if we can't identify what is it that is really a problem coming from us, and then what is it that comes from somebody else, disaggregate this. At, at the end of the day, you got to bring all that back together and say, because that's the whole problem we have to deal with. But you can't dismiss everything. <laughs> you see, yes, or, or keep postponing it yeah. and thinking somebody, why, why does somebody owe you anything anyway? I, I keep telling our people here, we may wait for another hundred years before we, we develop. If we keep thinking that uh, these foreign taxpayers owe us anything, mm -hmm. you know, you imagine that a European tax taxpayer in his country actually is responsible for your development and you believe it. Why? <laughs> Whether somebody is somewhere, yeah. why do they have to pay tax for people to come and feed you here? Why? You just ask yourself that question. Can I uh, and we believe it and sit back and wait for it. Yeah. It's absolutely... <laughs> Un, uh, un, 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 understandable. Yeah. Can I just take you because of Rwanda again these 20 years and we're talking to young people, what we say to them is that they've got a responsibility to conceptualize in their minds the kind of Africa they would like to see. Which means they have to have the capacity almost like an architect to look 10, 20 years henceforth and say I want an Africa which has got these attributes in that time and then come back to today to the reality and say, these are the steps I'm going to take in this time frame to get to there. That's the journey, the issue of planning. Mm -hmm. Often I get the impression that we are not very good at, firstly, planning with clarity. Where do I want to be in 10 years' time? Where am I starting from? What are the intervals that I'm going to use to review where I've got to, what I've achieved, and what I need to change? But clearly, the fact that this country has gotten to where you've got to, planning must have been one of the key issues and the clarity and the review over time to say, in the next 12 months we're going to do this. When that 12 months is gone, we can look back yes. and see whether we've achieved, not achieved, and, yes. and so on. Absolutely. Maybe you could share some of that with us. What I can share with you is... Uh, Sometimes you don't have to complicate things. You make them as simple as you can, even when they have a huge meaning. And we try to put uh, our understanding of what needs to be done in this country, and the future we want, and how we need to get there in a very simple language, in a simple language that has to be understood by everyone because everyone has participated. Part of it, yeah. yes. So we, we don't come and speak in languages that people will not even understand. You may come and address a big gathering of your own citizens and 
they clap for you because you are the president and they wanted you to have around with them. And um, is everything okay over there? Wait for them a little bit. You see, even when we know that what the problem is, mm. you go to the communities there and you also ask them what, what, they, what, what they think is the problem. Yeah. Together you understand the problem. Next step is, but where do we want to be? I'm putting planning and everything else aside a little bit. It's what the situation is now, <coughs> but I may ask somebody and say, but uh, where do you really want to be in 10 years? What do you think about where we need to be or should be? Well, they may look around you know, other places and say, why don't we become like the other ones? They have this, they have that. These are things we need. Mm. You say, fine. But how do we get there? How do we get from here? From here, this problem, to where we have agreed we need to go. Then that's where really the planning comes in. Yes, you, you, you need to understand how you get there and how the resources you have available and you know <laughs> the organization and responsibilities of everyone at different levels. And and this conversation in a simple language is understood by these ordinary people. And then you don't want to take things for granted that because you have discussed it, therefore it is understood by everybody, and then you go back and you say, I'll come back after five years. No. You go back and check, say, we, we, we have uh, an uh, arrangement here, uh, what we call IMIHIGO, the performance contracts. Mm -hmm. We have had with the mayors uh, of districts and with the central government and so on. It is what they expect from the central government. And there's also what the government, the central government says, we will give you what you expect from us, but we also expect you to address those problems. Mm -hmm. So together we've worked out how we check this development and, and hold accountable each other by going back every quarter and saying, okay, we agreed this was the problem, this is what was needed to be done, the resources that were going to be availed, whether through collections of the central, uh, the, 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 the centralized the district, the districts, or from central government, was money given, was it given in time? So was this money spent where we agreed needs, it needed to be spent? So what are the results? Mm -hmm. So that you don't have to wait for five years, and by the time you go back, you find actually nothing was done. So this is what we, we, we've been doing. And it, it has uh, worked. And let me tell you one thing, which uh, in, in modern societies has even become confused a little bit. I'll tell you, for example, the criticisms we come under uh, it's very important to know. It's like in Rwanda, all oh, things happen, you know, but, but you see, they are a bit hard on people. Mm. It, it's like they should let people do what they want to do. Mm. Fine. <laughs> Sometimes the, the, the line between letting people do whatever they want to do mm. and really finding ways for people to do what they need to do is extremely thin. Mm -hmm. But the, the reasoning and the logic of it can also be argued like this. And, and we are not saying these things from experience. It's not uh, theoretical. It's, it's, it's not 
just hearsay or anything. If you design and you have agreed with the people what needs to be done, what the problem is, what is good for them, and it has come from them, even with that good understanding, when you leave and they don't go back to check or to hold each other accountable, mm. nothing happens. Don't be surprised, <laughs> nothing happens. It's not just the expression of goodwill and understanding that it does things. So sometimes, in fact, even in the management itself, there is checking, there is holding each other accountable, there is a little push, yeah, you know, reminders and so on and so forth, which constitutes some kind of pressure, even in you know people's minds, and they start acting based on that. While if you don't practice that, you may, you'll find the majority of people, each one is saying, oh, somebody else will do it. Somebody else will do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> In that, the end, nobody does sad. it. Yeah. Yeah. But the good thing is, you may practice that kind of push for some time, up to a point when people actually internalize this and you know it is in their best interest. It becomes a habit. And it becomes a habit. Yeah. Yes, you no longer need to enforce it. But at a certain point, there's some kind of enforcement that goes on. Not just expecting that, well, you can expect goodwill from an individual, from the other, from two, from ten, but to expect that from a society and say, well, they understand it, so they, they would do it. And, well, in, in school, we write exams <laughs> regularly, don't we? Yes, it's a similar sure. thing. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is, this is what has been happening. So, but again, you don't push, just push without having clearly designed. You know, you have po policies in place that are intended to achieve, achieve something and that have been contributed to by the people themselves that who are going to be affected. You also design processes. How, how are you going to... Yes, the policies? Yeah. There are policies and, uh, and, 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 and processes. And then you expect the results. So you keep you know, monitoring the results. Yeah. And if the results are not happening the way they should happen, then you need to go back and keep checking through the system. Mm -hmm. how, how are things happening? Mm -hmm. it's, it's just as simple as that. It's like somebody, you know, has a heart problem. He's given a medicine. The doctor gives a medicine. Yeah. You know, the doctor keeps listening, you know, on, see, well, yeah. <laughs> on the, the heart beat, whether or not, yeah. is the medicine really doing the right thing yeah. or not. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's as simple as that. And if you put this in a simple language to every citizen, mm -hmm. they will understand it. And they will understand it and link it with the needs they have. If, if that understanding connects directly with the problem this citizen has, they will participate. Okay. Yes. That's, uh, before I open it up, just one last question, which again, it appears to me this country is managed incredibly well. So, you know, I spent some time in Washington at IFC. I spent some time at the ADB in Tunis. And the relationship between African countries and development partners is a, a challenging one in the sense that, you know, there is a, an expression in English which says, he who pays the piper calls the tune. Mm -hmm. And in most African countries, it appears to a lot of us that when people give you money, they tend to enforce their agenda rather than accept yours. Mm -hmm. How have you managed this? It's, um, <coughs> I think sometimes we need to be stubborn to, <laughs> to do things and get results. <laughs> and, but, you, you, can, you can be stubborn and reasonable at the same time. And if, you're and, cre and if you are credible. Absolutely. Yeah, you're this, credible. Is, this is what uh, you need to do. Because what we have done, we knew all these problems. Uh, you know, that's the very old saying you, you put to us. Even starting from that, we know. 
and we start from understanding this is our problem. But there's somebody there who is saying, well, I can help. That's fine. But we must have a dialogue. At the end of the day, the problem we are addressing is mine. I'm the one being affected. Mm -hmm. So how the problem gets addressed and how fast it gets addressed is more in my interest than yours, actually. Yeah. Now, so we, we, from the, right from the beginning, we, we understood this, and we, had, we tried to raise it with our partners and said, look, we really appreciate your support. It's very vital. It's very important. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if you give us this kind of support and it results into dependence, then we are not addressing the problem. We want to be assisted to own our problems and our solutions. And in fact, we told them, we see there is no conflict. If you are supporting me, if you are giving me money, first of all, what are you giving me this money for? It's not because I have done anything for you. It's not a, a job I have done. Yeah. You're not paying. You're not paying. Yeah. So you are assisting. If you are assisting, then my job is to make sure and convince you that the money you gave me assisting me was actually useful to the people you intended to have their problem addressed. Yeah. That's the only satisfaction you should be getting from that money. And so we will do our best, and we even allow you to come and hold us accountable to make sure that the money you gave us, if it was going for education, it education has really benefited and it worked. And then we say, beyond this, what else would you want? And what is the basis? Yeah. And has it been an easy? It has never been easy. <laughs> That, that's why I, think I was saying you need to be stubborn. You have yeah. to stay, you know, on the course of, uh, as they stay on the course of, uh, you know, causing you problems, you stay on the course of uh, pushing back. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You, you don't give in because at the end of the day, it is really us who will benefit from the good that will have been done or the bad that will have yeah. been done and suffer from that. So. It has not been easy, but this is a, a mentality issue again, which is, by the way, part of the problem we have to address in our continent. It's a mindset. It's, it's, what, it's what are you convinced about yourself? Yeah. What are you what, convinced about your problem that you need to address? And what clarity do you have? Absolutely, yeah. based on that. Mm. And if you don't develop this, then you'll always have a problem. You'll find that the way things were done 20 years ago that were not giving results is the same way as you are applying to a new mm. situation which will not give you any results. So which, why, why would you keep? Yeah. <laughs> which means they also lose credit. You lose credibility. Oh, yes. Now they can push back and say, but Absolutely. you don't deliver on what you promise. But gladly, things have changed. Yeah. I don't know elsewhere, but I think elsewhere where they don't push back, things happen still happen the way they used to happen decades ago. But happily here, I would say, progress has been made. Because of this pushing back and arguing and... They are and then delivering. And, uh -huh. then delivering. and then proving our point by delivering. We have convinced many partners. They, they still bring their side issues and, you know, there are things that you can't quantify, which they always keep arguing. <laughs> You see, if you are talking about development, is it, you know, you can see the infrastructure, you can see in the schools, kids are studying, and so on and so forth. This can be measured. Yeah. And you can't really argue with that yeah. when somebody says, look, come, let's measure, and yeah. you, you do that. But there are things that you can't measure that are very subjective, so they stick to that. They keep saying, oh, freedoms, 
and you say which what freedoms what are they talking about because freedoms you can't really measure you can't put it. and they say but freedoms and you say well, okay what freedoms i say no 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 we, we think freedoms yeah. <laughs> then they <laughs> Then they say, uh, political space. Yeah. So we say, we, which space? Yeah. <laughs> what, what space are you talking about? They say, no, but you see. Because, and they say, okay, let's measure that if you want. What are you talking about? They say, no, 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 but, but space. <laughs> <laughs> we need a space. Yeah. So we go on that endlessly, yeah. but we say, okay. <laughs> At least, if there is money you are giving for space, don't give that money. <laughs> <laughs> but if there is money you are giving for kids to go to school, then I can show you. Please yeah. give that money, and I will go and show you that kids have gone to school. <laughs> so we are still going with this, but this is not very dangerous. We keep. Okay. Moving forward. Yeah. Can Mr. President, are you okay if we take a few questions? I'm sure, sure, sure. these youngsters will not be happy with me if they didn't give them the opportunity to ask. Well, absolutely. Yeah, um, Good thank you. And I think uh, a big hand first of all to Dr. Moyan <laughs> to His Excellency the President. And I want, as you're listening to these questions, Mr. President, uh, to keep I'm not saying you're not young, you're young. And young people come in all shapes and sizes. Depends on where you're starting from. <laughs> exactly. Some come tall and lean, some do not come tall and lean. Yeah. Young people come in all shapes and sizes. But on a serious note, I want you to keep that in mind because you still have, in some senses, a way that you can empathize with how young people think. And I think that's where these questions are coming from. Mm. And so I'll go to the first question. Um, I think we have them somewhere. Yeah, there you go. You'll understand how this is working. Relax. Thank you. Your Excellency, I'm happy to see you. My name is Natumaya Sara from Uganda, and this is the question I have for you. How best can the youth how best can the youth in Africa make their voice heard concerning issues of governance in their respective countries? Thank you. Mr. President, she didn't say she was happy to see me, just said she was happy to see you. <laughs> I, I think you're the rock star. We'll, we'll take the other two and then uh, perhaps start getting some answer. Be taking one after another. Do you want to do? Okay, fine. It's, it's your choice. Yeah, please. All right. So perhaps you want to go with Sarah's question? Well, how the youth can make a difference in this regard, you are raising the question is, as I said, there is what the youth themselves need to do, collectively, or even individually, because they contribute to the collective. And there is what needs to be done generally, even by others, which was the environment. I think we, we had this discussion. So if I, I would say in the, in the countries, in each country, the youth, I think there are provisions in any country of, of how people organize themselves. I think, and the moment you organize yourself, yourselves for a good cause, the good cause of everyone, of the collective, I think normally you will not find really impediment. So if, if youth get organized, and confront these issues we are talking about. First by analyzing them and talking about them and then charting out ways through which they can address those challenges. And not doing it just as youths or simply thinking about the problems affecting the youth in isolation, but rather putting the problems affecting the youth in the general context of the whole country, because you are part of any country you are in. So that is the starting point. But through that, you are also trying to interact with other levels to say, we want our place, 
what can we do? We want to do something for the common good of all of us, the young, the old. We, we want our country to develop. It's a kind of polite, <coughs> legitimate, firm demand that you should make, but also organize how to achieve that. I think, I think this is uh, one way you, you could do that, an important way. Okay. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, my name is Stephen Mashua. Um, I come from Kenya. Uh, in relation to regional integration, um, something that you've been actively involved in, um, how effective have you been in uh, involving both continental and national youth leadership uh, in uh, pol both policy development and uh, technical skills provision uh, for sustainability, since we normally say young people are the, uh, are the leaders of the future. Mm. Well, the best way to look at it is, you see, it's a journey, really. We, we, we are not where we need to be far from that. But I think in, in every country, uh, I, I've noticed uh, or generally across the continent, there is some kind of, if you will, soul searching among other things. What is it that uh, countries, communities, the young, the old, do to make sure that, of course, whenever you talk about young people, uh, you, you are not just talking about the present, you are mainly talking about the future. And, and I think both the young and the old understand this. So. There is that talking about the problem going on everywhere in every country, as I see it. I think the main question for me, and probably which fits what you are saying as well, is not so much what are we doing uh, to deal with this problem, as it is for how fast are we dealing with it. Because for me, there are many things that are being done across the continent that actually go in line with the question that you are raising. But I think we should just be getting impatient to say we can't keep saying, doing things. Taking forever. Yes, and taking forever before we really realize progress. I think this is for me the main thing. In many <coughs> countries across our continent, there is no country that will not show you programs they have to address youth employ employment and problems and um, many others involving the youth or structures of how they participate in the parliament, how they do this, how they organize, how, you know, entrepreneurship and so on and so forth, or even through education. All that is there. But the question now should be what for me is what, how do we do these things to accelerate you know, the results we want to achieve. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Nuno Diana from South Sudan. Uh, my question is, what would be your advice of how youths can contribute in fighting issues such as corruption, poor service delivery, and poor governance in their respective countries and the continent at large? Yeah, a couple of things. One is, um, you see, what, what is also lacking is capacity. People need to, we need to build capacity for our people to do what needs to be done in strengthening the institutions that will really deliver uh, to our people what, what they need delivered. Capacity through education, training, and but uh, alongside that, every time, I think we need to be thinking about uh, behavioral issues. <laughs> this is how, how do we behave, uh, even as, a, as, as communities. How, uh, so uh, youth, the youth to fight corruption, first is to avoid the corruption. <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't participate in the corruption and then you think you are fighting it. Yeah. It's really to develop resentment for it. Yeah. And, but, and, say, and also keep thinking about the alternatives. Because the alternatives are there. 
people can, you know, progress, can make progress, can prosper with it doesn't have to be contributed to by corruption. But, but people have this wrong notion, it's like, uh, you know, corruption makes people rich. But how many? <laughs> I think it makes uh, fewer people rich and impoverishes the majority. So uh, now if you have a few who have become rich through corruption, and then you, 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 you you make them your own models, you, you admire them, you want to be like them, and through the same process they got there, then you have uh, the whole nation in danger. So first of all, you need to, to look to understand the alternatives. Countries, communities can prosper, can you know, raise their incomes, can make good progress through doing decent things. So we, need, we so we have the, we therefore need to develop the capacity not only to create these structures and institutions that people operate through and deliver what is expected, but we need to keep working at the attitudes. Yes, the, the thing corruption. It is a danger almost in everything. It's politics, it's the economy, it's uh, even the well-being of society. Yes, it's, it's a bad culture, so we need to tackle it and, and change it and go the alternative route. So, of course, from South Sudan, we, we have sympathies for you on many grounds, because before the country has taken off after getting independence, it is coming down again through you know, the war that is raging there and all kinds of reasons people have used to find uh, that as a way of resolving uh, problems, it's a pathetic. This is one example that uh, is really an extreme side of things that we need to look at and, and say, why, why do we need to have this situation? First of all, it was like God sent to really have South Sudan as a new you know, nation trying to, you know, everybody celebrated. We all celebrated with South Sudan that it was getting independence, there's something. Now, before we, just as we were getting out of the celebratory, you know, the mood for celebration, then <laughs> there is the war and we are going back to. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, uh, but anyway, but that question you asked can be part of the solution. There is a lot in, in South Sudan that people can live for and aspire to, you know, to achieve, and, and there, is, there, there are means to do that. But we, we, we can pursue that by avoiding corruption so that every penny is put to good use. I must say, Mr. President, I really like your, and say, I have not heard this before, stop participating in corruption. Yes. As opposed to just pointing at other people, say, I will stop participating in Absolutely. corruption. Absolutely. 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 All right, number four. <laughs> Jacobo Waiswa Buganga is my name from Uganda. Uh, your Excellency, uh, the Africa Natural Resources, Your Excellency, the Africa Natural Resources have increasingly become under intense pressure from inter external players. Uh, those external, uh, external players are prompted to to go to move out, and the internal players are, are scared of uh, the, the resources that are not, are not able to support them. Uh, and, and now here we, we, we are increasing, increasing experiencing an issue from the West and East. What position should Africa be taking to ensure that they are utilized, these resources are utilized to benefit the people and the continent without creating an, uh, an environment problem uh, so that these resources are not uh, a curse, as in some instances are, are, are said to be, but a blessing to them. And what strategies do we uh -huh. Do you propose uh, need to be put in place to safeguard such resources for the present 
and future African generations. Thank you. Yeah. First of all, the resources issue is not a new one, and uh, the exploitation part of it is not even a new one. Uh, but again, it really comes back to the earlier discussions we had. Uh, uh, why should the resources turn into a curse in the first place? Uh, I think lack of them is the curse. That uh, that's what should be. Some of yes, that's what it should be. <laughs> not, not not having resources, but. Having resources and they turn into a curse means there is another problem altogether. It's not resources. Uh, and it is, speaks to governance, to leadership, to how we work together. And, and again, how do we raise our value, really, <laughs> as a people? Yeah. In the, yeah. So how, how can we always be thinking about ourselves as being caught up between the West and the East? <laughs> you see, we should be thinking about how do we become players ourselves? How do we sit on the same table with them, around the same table with them? Rather than... How do we take advantage of them competing abs for our resources? Yes, absolutely. Precisely that, depending on... You, because of even the situation we are in, yes, we, we should be saying, okay, we, we've uh, in the past this thing happened to us, but in the present, now people are conflicting, you know, yeah. over our resources, and so we should take ownership of our resources and uh, leverage that, you know, to say, you know, it mean, it, it means the the value has even increased. So we need to, <laughs> you know, because if you can't take it, the other one will take it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so but, but pay, the terms, pay me more. yes, pay me more. Uh -huh. <laughs> you bring more. What are the terms are you setting? I think this is really the main issue to, to the, the, but we, we can't answer that question unless we resolve the very problems we were discussing here earlier with the Nkosana, you know, about we Africans, the youth, the, you know, all of us, and the way we conduct ourselves, or the way we conduct our businesses, what we need to do. That is where it is, because the question is simple. Why should we allow ourselves to be victims caught up in between, you know, or in the battlefield between the East and the West? Yeah. When we've got the resources. Well, when we have <laughs> what they are fighting over. <laughs> this is the question, yeah. We must answer that, yes. Last yeah. question, I think. Sorry, yes. I think uh, Two more, um, His Excellency the President, my name is Abdul Karim Kuruma from Sierra Leone. All right, okay, thank you. My question is that um, it's similar to the question that was asked earlier. Africa is regarded as one of the richest continents in the world in terms of natural resources. But ironically, it is the poorest continent in the world. As an African leader, we would like to know where you think the problems lie and what should be some of the ways that you should contribute in addressing this problem. The problem simply lies with us. That's the short of it. It, it. The problem is with us. It's not with those who take our resources. Actually, it is a, they should take these resources because we have failed to manage them. Yes, I think so. <laughs> I don't want anybody to, to just be kind to me <laughs> in my failures. Yes. Yeah. It's like a simple way. If you live... Uh, in some place full of uh, thieves, uh, and uh, every night you forget to close the door, <laughs> and they, when you are you are sleeping, they come and help themselves. At the end of the day, it's, you, 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 one must be foolish not to remember to close the door, and, uh, you know. Yeah. So, 
really, I don't blame those. I, I have stopped blaming those who exploit these resources of ours. I think that's what they need to do for people who don't know what to do with their resources. Yes. So why don't we look to ourselves and say, no, this must stop. The, the way it must stop is not by the other one being kind to you. No. It's by you saying you can't have these resources anymore just like that. Period. Yeah. All right. Lock your doors. Don't forget. Uh, the last one? <laughs> yes. Yes, the last one. Right at the back of the room. Your Excellency. Oh. Right, right at the back, yeah. yeah. You were speaking, yes. Go ahead. You, Go you ahead. know how to you <laughs> take, take advantage of Okay. She forgot to lock her door. Okay. Your Excellency, I'm yes. Samia from Sudan. Uh, my question to you as a president what uh, you learn from your people and what's the uh, inspiration that your people give it to you to change your policies towards something and the other question is what's your advice to the african leaders that they have the same experience that rwanda has passed through and you you know you confront these difficulties and the third one uh, I hope, as a, as a citizen, a Sudanese citizen, I invite you to come to Sudan and reflect <laughs> this wonderful experience. And I'm very impressed by the Rwandan experience before I come. I came here. In my mind, this is a destroyed African countries, and now I'm very, you know, impressed by your experience. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. But really, the issue is simple. Uh, first of all, I, I don't think. We are going to be here thinking so much about uh, giving lessons to, to anyone, but about sharing where we have come from and where we are and how we've addressed some of the challenges that we can share, and we are doing so now freely. Uh, but I think every country, including Sudan, has a lot to learn from within its own borders and the problems they face. You see, these, the problems you face should <coughs> shed some light as to which direction you need to take before anybody else even tells you that. You may find some of the things we, we have faced here and the way we have overcome them Part of it may fit very well and work very well for Sudan, but part of that may not work for Sudan. So you, you, one needs to tailor whatever solution or, or sharing of experience or any lessons that can be drawn from anywhere to the actual problem and in a, in a, in a particular place. Uh, so I think that's the way to approach it. That's the way we have used. Uh, to, to, to deal with our problems. Right, finally, 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 your chance to speak. <laughs> we keep quiet, we take it away. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Your Excellency, my name is Benetta Davis and I'm from Liberia. And here's my question. What do you think African leaders can do differently to build and ensure that peace on the continent is sustained besides what the AU, that is the African Union, has in place already? Mm -hmm. Well, again, uh, it's one thing and a very important thing to be talking about the whole continent of Africa. But we should remember that we, we can't have peace across uh, the whole continent without having peace in every part of the continent. <laughs> you know, it's the, we have to bring peace in each of our countries we add up to peace across the continent. So that's why we have to be thinking like this. We are thinking about integration, bringing things together across the continent, and, you know, for the benefit of the whole continent. But we have to know that we are starting from individual country and, and what 
that individual country is going through. So together, it gives us, so if, if you're talking about Liberia, the history of Liberia, part of which is similar to, to our own here in Rwanda, you see, if, if in Rwanda there is lack of peace, <coughs> and in Liberia there is lack of it, then uh, the whole continent suffers in a way, because we keep affecting either our neighbors and even beyond. So getting things right in our countries and thinking about integration at the same time helps to realize this uh, faster than we otherwise would. So we have to keep, there's a lot of work for us to do. Right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I think he deserves a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. President, we're just doing that because you're our host. We, we, you actually <laughs> Most us, welcome. You actually made us quite thank delighted. You. Now, we promise yeah, we'll. Before, yes, though. please, oh, Dr. Moore. Mr. President, if you allow me, I'm not going to try and summarize what happened here, but there is two things that you said which almost like go through everything we discussed, and I think I would like just those two statements to, to be highlighted. Mm -hmm. when, when you made the observation that I personally stopped participating in corruption, taking personal responsibility, I think virtually every single question that was asked in this room, the same approach can be applied to it. It's okay to ask about what other people should do, leaders should do, but maybe it's more important to ask, what should I do? What can I do? Literally to every single one of those questions that was asked. The second takeaway for me was when we were discussing the credibility that this country is built with respect to its development partners. And what I took away from there, if I may reduce it to one sentence again, almost a phrase, is that credibility creates spaces. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you, uh, President Kagame. Thank you, Dr. Moyo, for conducting this quite excellent. Like, uh, I, I advise my sister there from Sudan. You got hold of microphone, stick with it. Don't you just pass it on. <laughs> Make use of it and move on. <laughs>